Tom. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be among friends, uh, friends, esteemed colleagues, our new president, uh, students, pastors from the area. Uh, welcome to you all, and thank you for joining us today uh, for this scripture and ministry uh, session. I'm looking forward to having an opportunity to discuss after uh, my address to discuss some of the themes that I'm going to be raising uh, because ultimately I'm looking at the intersection between what we might say, uh, what we might call history and practical theology. And some of you who are in pastoral ministry now uh, will help us understand how, how the historical narrative can fit and perhaps even be applied in our contemporary work and ministry. So thanks so much for coming. In an article that appeared in the New York Times in August of 2010, Paul Vitello described the serious difficulties faced by many Christian ministers in America today. Here I quote, Members of the cl clergy now suffer from obesity, hypertension, and depression at rates higher than most Americans. In the last decade, their use of antidepressants has risen while their life expectancy has fallen. Many would change jobs if they could. Public health experts who have led the studies caution that there is no simple explanation of why so many members of a profession once associated with rosy-cheeked longevity have become so unhealthy and unhappy. In recent years, researchers have attempted to isolate the leading causes for pastoral dissatisfaction and poor health and identify primary reasons why so many Christian workers leave parish ministry each year. One such endeavor was the Pulpit and Pew Research Project of Duke Divinity School, a quantitative study conducted a decade ago that examined 500 ministers from five different Protestant denominations that had recently left pastoral ministry. Although a variety of factors were listed, the three most common reasons given by Christian workers who had left local church ministry were as follows. First, I felt drained by the demands on me. Second, I felt lonely and isolated. Third, I felt bored or constrained in my position. Thankfully, a variety of helpful resources are now available to provide support and encouragement for pastors who are burned out, bummed out, burdened, or bored with congregational ministry. Discouraged ministers and their spouses can share their self-doubts, their struggles, their horror stories with other ministers on websites such as pastorburnout.com. If you haven't checked it out, please do so. Internet sites such as the Gospel Coalition or Reformation 21 frequently speak to the problems faced by Christian pastors, offering solid theological, biblical, and practical advice for wounded or weary spiritual warriors. So too, a bevy of helpful journals and books are now available that expose many of the dangers inherent in pastoral culture in modern America and suggest steps that ministers can take towards spiritual health. I'm sure we could amass a long list of such books. Uh, among my favorites are Eugene Peterson's Working the Angles, The Shape of Pastoral Integrity, which is an old classic. More recent, Lee Eklov's fine book, Pastoral Graces, Reflections on the Care of Souls. And of course, our own Donald Guthrie's Resilient Ministry, What Pastors Told Us About Surviving and Thriving, which he... Uh, conducted, uh, this book wrote and conducted the study behind this book along with Tasha Chapman and Bob Burns. One important resource for pastoral health and faithfulness that is usually overlooked in contemporary discussions, however, is the history of the pastoral office. The practices, convictions, and institutions that have been important in nourishing and strengthening gospel ministers in the church's past. For the last dozen years or so, my research focus here at Trinity has been on the history of the pastoral office, looking particularly at how Protestant reformers like Martin Luther, 
Martin Bootser, Theodore Beza, and John Calvin, as well as others, redefined the pastoral office and restructured the life and work of Christian ministers. Time and time again, I've been impressed by how insightful and relevant, how potentially helpful the practice of ministry during the Reformation is for contemporary practice. Now, when we study the history of the church and seek to apply its lessons to the present, there are two extremes that we need to avoid. On the one hand, we need to avoid antiquarianism, the assumption that older is better. We need to avoid repristinating the past, the practices and beliefs of the past, without critical assessment. We need to appreciate, for sure, the radically different contexts. The antiquarian says, if it's good enough for Luther, it's good enough for me. And that approach isn't helpful. But nor is the opposite approach, that of the presentist, who assumes that newer is necessarily better. The belief that models and practices of the past are irrelevant, of little use for today. C.S. Lewis called this approach chronological snobbery. It's like the hubris of a teenager who tells his parents, you have nothing to teach me. I know more than you do. A more faithful approach is to avoid, on the one hand, antiquarianism, or on the other hand, presentism, and approach the church's past with a sympathetic yet critical eye, to have a teachable spirit that is able to learn from the insights, the wisdom, and the mistakes of the past, even as we recognize that context matters and that not every ancient conviction or practice can or should be adopted in the present. It's with this spirit, then, in my lecture this afternoon, that I will focus upon the model of ministry created by John Calvin in Geneva between 1536 and 1564, exploring the specific practices and institutions that he and Geneva's ministers adopted to promote pastoral collegiality, accountability, spiritual vitality, and gospel faithfulness. I will proceed in three sections. First, I will provide, first of all, a brief overview of Calvin's conception of the ministry of the Word and how the ministry of the Word found expression in Calvin's Geneva. Then, in section two, I will describe four church institutions that Calvin established in Geneva to foster pastoral collegiality, reconciliation, accountability, and faithfulness. And then thirdly, very briefly, I'll suggest several points of application for contemporary ministry that I think we can draw from Calvin and his company of pastors in Geneva. So, section one, Calvin's conception of the ministry of the word. One of the first documents that Calvin wrote after his Protestant conversion in, scholars believe, 1533 or 1534, was to write a preface for his cousin's French translation of the Bible. His cousin's name was Pierre Olivier Tom. And in 1534, Calvin will write the preface for this outlawed, contraband translation of the Bible. The Bible had been published without the royal privilege. It was contraband. It was illegal. And in his preface, John Calvin will pick up on this theme. He writes, The king of kings is the guarantor of the privilege to publish this book. But the ungodly voices of some are heard shouting that it is a shameful thing to publish these divine mysteries among the common people. But since the Lord has chosen for himself prophets from the ranks of shepherds, apostles from the boats of fishermen, why should he not even now decide to choose similar disciples? And then Calvin writes this, But I desire only this, that faithful people be permitted to hear their God speaking and to learn from his teaching. In many ways, that statement serves as a kind of life goal, a life purpose for John Calvin. I desire only this, that faithful people be permitted to hear their God speaking. 
and to learn from his teaching. Calvin believed that God's word and his faithful proclamation needed to be at the center, at the core of church life and ministry. Preaching the word, Calvin noted, was one of the chief marks of a true Christian church. Elsewhere, he stated, here I quote, For God, there is nothing higher than preaching the gospel, because it is the means to lead people to salvation. On another occasion, Calvin writes, God's honor consists especially of this, that people know him and that poor souls are led to salvation. Let us therefore not be surprised when our Lord desires that his gospel is proclaimed with so much zeal that nothing can prevent its course. For the only means by which people may be saved is to be instructed in the teaching of the gospel. For John Calvin, the proclamation of the word of God in sermon and in song and in liturgy was at the heart of the church's mission, at the heart of the church's task, at the center of the pastor's vocation. And thus, when Calvin arrived in Geneva in 1536 as a foreigner, and indeed Calvin spent most of the rest of his life in Geneva as an exile, at the center of his reform program, number one priority was to bring the word of God to full form, to center stage within the religious life of Geneva. Within several months of arriving in Geneva, Calvin, along with his assistant, Guillaume Farrell, restructured parish life within the city walls, where there had once been seven or eight churches and chapels, Calvin reduced the parishes to three. St. Pierre, La Madeleine, St. Gervais. And he looked for six to eight pastors who would serve as a pastoral company to serve those three urban parishes within Geneva's city walls. At the same time, Calvin and Farrell restructured parish life in the surrounding countryside that was governed by Geneva. And some 25 or 30 very tiny Catholic parishes were restructured into 12 Reformed parishes that would be pastored by Reformed men. Calvin's vision was that the Christian sermon would be at the heart of religious life within the city. Within several years, sermons were held every day of the week in Geneva's three urban parishes. There was a sunrise service at 4 a.m. in the summer, 5 a.m. in the winter, for uh, the servant class. They could hear a sermon before they went off to work and fix breakfast for their masters. There were daily morning sermons at 6 a.m. during the summer, 7 a.m. during the winter for the rest of town folk. There were three sermons in each of the three churches provided on Sundays. An 8 a.m. sermon, a catechetical sermon at noon, and the 3 p.m. afternoon sermon. By 1561, there were 33 preaching services that took place within the city walls each week. Preaching was expositional. As the Reformed ministers preached verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book through the biblical canon. Old Testament books were preached from during the week. The New Testament and Psalms were proclaimed on Sundays. We know that for Calvin himself, Calvin preached on average of 16 to 20 sermons a month. During the course of his ministry, scholars believe he may well have preached as many as 4,000 sermons. His style, as was the style of other ministers in Geneva, was to preach Lectio Continua, to preach successively, expositionally through the biblical text. And this could result in some very long sermon series. For example, between the years 1554 and 1556, Calvin preached no fewer than 200 sermons from the book of Deuteronomy. A few years later, he preached almost as many sermons through the book of Job. This then was a word-saturated ministry that Calvin established in Geneva. 
But the word was to be proclaimed. It was to be announced not simply in the sermon, but also in the liturgy. In Calvin's Geneva, the sermon was, as it were, attached to a full-blown liturgy on Wednesday mornings and then again on Sunday mornings and Sunday afternoons. Calvin's liturgy, which he wrote in the early 1540s, was filled with biblical language as well as biblical themes. In the invocation, in the prayer of confession, in the prayer of illumination, in the pastoral prayer, as the congregation recited the Lord's Prayer, in the benediction, and of course in the reading of Scripture itself during the Sunday morning service, the Word of God was preeminent. So too in the singing of the Psalms. Calvin introduced psalm singing to his Genevan congregation. Through Calvin's initiative, several of France's greatest poets were hired to translate the Psalter into the French vernacular. The Genevan Psalter was completed in 1562, and within several weeks, more than 27,000 copies had been printed. Indeed, over the next four years, there will be 60 editions we're talking hundreds of thousands of copies of the French Psalter published in Geneva to be used in Geneva and in France. Now, for those of us in a contemporary context who are used to singing hymns, the notion of singing only psalms seems perhaps quaint or old-fashioned. But remember the context. In medieval Europe, there was no congregational singing. To be sure, there was singing by trained choirs at high masses. But before the age of the Reformation in the 16th century, there, there was not congregational singing. And so the shock, the surprise, when the people of God would gather in Geneva or elsewhere in the French-speaking world to sing the Psalms, to sing the Word of God as the people of God, was truly memorable. Theodore Beza, at the end of his life, as he comments on one of the psalms, remembers that this was the psalm that he had first heard sung when he and his wife fled from Paris and came to Geneva as refugees. After 35 years, he could still remember what song had been sung, what psalm had been sung within the congregation of Geneva. It was that much of a surprise. It was that, that moving of an experience for him. So the sermon... The liturgy, Calvin's catechism, too, infused with the Word of God. In 327 questions and answers, children were taught basic Christian doctrine. And many of the responses that children would give to their pastors were the words of Scripture. Children were required to memorize the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer. In other words... They were trained in what they must do, what they must believe, and how they should pray. But again, the catechism was a document to bring people into the message, the meaning, and the very words of Scripture. We should also say something about Bible production. Geneva, during the age of Calvin, was a veritable factory for the production of Bibles both in Latin and in vernacular translations. Betty Chambers has shown that between 1550 and 1600, 80 editions of the French Bible were produced in Geneva. Another 80 editions of the New Testament French Bible was produced as well. In addition to French and Latin, Genevan printers released Italian versions, Spanish versions, English versions, as well as Greek and Hebrew versions of the Bible. Now, we might well ask why Scripture and the proclamation of Scripture was so important in Geneva's Reformation. And the answer was this. Calvin, as well as Luther and Beza and Bootser, the list goes on, were convinced that the Bible was God's Word. And that through its faithful proclamation, in sermon, in song, in liturgy, God continues to work 
powerfully to renew the Christian church and to reform his people. Through the proclamation of the word, God brings salvation to the hard-hearted. Through the proclamation of the word, God nourishes and fortifies his beloved children. Through the proclamation of the word, God builds his church. For Calvin, the proclamation of God's word, the scripture, stands at the center of the church's ministry. Listen to Calvin's comments on the famous passage in Romans chapter 10, where Paul writes, How then can they preach unless they are sent? Words of Calvin. Paul intimates that it is a proof and a pledge of divine love when any nation is favored with the preaching of the gospel, and that no one is a preacher of it unless God has raised them up in his special providence. Hence, it is a certain fact that God visits the nation to which the gospel is proclaimed. From this, we also learn how much all good men and women should desire and value the preaching of the gospel, which is thus commended to us by the mouth of the Lord himself. God has thus spoken highly of the incomparable value of this treasure for the purpose of awakening the minds of everyone so that they may anxiously desire it. Let's move on to section two, reforming the pastoral office for institutions. If scripture formed the foundation of Christian ministry in Geneva, then Calvin's institutions, as it were, were the buildings upon which that foundation were built. During his years in Geneva, Calvin restructured the pastoral office in a variety of ways so as to encourage collegiality, accountability, unity, and the spiritual well-being of the Protestant ministers who served the city. In particular, Calvin created several new institutions that shaped pastoral culture in the city for generations, indeed centuries to come. Now, I realize that for many of Many of us as evangelicals were somewhat wary of institutions, or at least of institutionalism. We're wary of too much priority be given to preserving organizations or creating organizations rather than caring for people and pursuing godly goals and purposes. However, Christian institutions, that is, organizations created to promote or preserve specific gospel concerns can be a great blessing to Christians and to churches. Institutions can be created that serve the cause of Christ in our world to a significant degree. I think here of the words of James K.A. Smith, who in an article entitled, We Believe in Institutions, has it just right, I think. Here I quote, In a cynical age that tends to glorify the startups, and celebrate anti-institutional suspicion, faith in institutions will sound dated, stodgy, old-fashioned, even conservative. But if you're really passionate about fostering the common good, then you should resist anti-institutionalism because institutions are ways to love our neighbors. Institutions are durable, concrete structures that, when functioning well, Cultivate all of creation's potential towards what God desires. Shalom, peace, goodness, justice, flourishing, delight. Calvin recognized the importance of creating church and clerical institutions to preserve his theological and pastoral legacy. This afternoon, I'd like to mention four of those institutions. First, Calvin's Company of Pastors. The Company of Pastors, sometimes called the Venerable Company of Pastors, was founded in the mid-1540s, shortly after Calvin returned from his second exile in the city of Strasbourg. The Company of Pastors came to include all of the city's pastors, those pastors both who served within the city walls and those pastors who served countryside parishes. In 
the, this group of pastors, numbering some 15 to 18 men, would meet every Friday morning for several hours at a time. The company of pastors was overseen by a moderator who happened to be Calvin during his lifetime. Uh, after Calvin died, the moderatorship uh, became an elective post, a kind of first among equals uh, who would serve the body uh, as de facto head of the company for a period of a year or several years at a time. The company of pastors was built on the central conviction of the equality of the ministry. All Christian ministers, it was believed, possess equal authority under the word of God to proclaim the gospel and administer the sacraments. Calvin may have had greater moral authority than his colleagues in Geneva, but technically... All of Geneva's ministers were equal gospel partners. They all possessed the same calling. When the company gathered to conduct business, each minister had one vote. This commitment to collegiality and pastoral equality was foundational to Calvin's understanding of the pastoral office. Week by week, the company of pastors engaged in a number, of a number and various activities. On the one hand, the company had what we might call an internal face, responsibilities that were targeting the church in Geneva. The company of pastors, as they met week after week, assured that right doctrine was taught from the city's pulpits. The company recruited and examined new pastors, the company oversaw theological education in the city. The company offered godly advice and sometimes correction to the city's magistrates. The company monitored public worship services. The company also oversaw the so-called Bourse Francaise, a kind of uh, charitable institution which collected money to support refugees in the city with temporary housing and loans and distributed financial support to widows and orphans. On one occasion, the company even worked on a Bible translation together, which bore fruit in the so-called French translation of the Company of Pastors that was published in 1588. Certainly, one of the primary concerns of the company of pastors was to provide care for the pastors themselves. And this was especially true of countryside pastors. If there were challenges of being a pastor within the city walls, being a pastor in the small rural parishes was far more difficult yet. They were poorly paid. They often struggled to relate to the backwoods, rough congregants within their parishes. Oftentimes, countryside parishes had to uh, pay bills by uh, raising farm animals and by tending their gardens. Most countryside parishes had multiple congregations that they serviced, and so they would travel during the week four or five miles to preach the gospel in, in small hamlets within their parish boundaries. After Calvin died in 1564, the problems became even more difficult. For Catholic Savoy, an aggressive neighboring country, continually raided the churches in the countryside. It wasn't uncommon for Genevan pastors in the countryside to be kidnapped, held as hostages, or even killed. On several occasions, Savoyard soldiers came, broke down church doors, and occupied churches uh, even leaving their munitions and their supplies in the Reformed chapels and churches. In all of these situations, the company of, past intervened. Uh, company of pastors intervened, providing support and encouragement, supervising the needs, appealing for more wages, providing prayer and advice to these countryside pastors. That then was the internal face of the company of pastors. But Geneva's company of pastors also had an external face, focused on the larger world, on the larger Protestant world of not only Western Europe, but Eastern Europe as well. 
The company of pastors maintained a vast correspondence with churches throughout Europe, from Scotland and Poland and Hungary, southern France, Germany, Switzerland, and beyond. And in this correspondence, the company provided advice to foreign churches, sometimes petitioning the support of those foreign churches and governments. The company of pastors raised money for persecuted Protestant churches abroad. It was not uncommon for foreign churches to write letters asking for pastoral candidates. And so the company of pastors would hand select young men trained at the Genevan Academy and send them off to Scotland or to Hungary or to Poland. Moreover, between 1555 and 1564, the company of pastors secretly recruited, trained, and deployed missionaries, pastoral missionaries, back to France. This uh, long-forgotten story was uncovered by a very fine Reformation scholar named Robert Kingdon, who spent his career teaching Reformation studies at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Over that nine-year period, more than 120 men, again, were secretly recruited and sent into Catholic France to plant and to support French Reformed congregations. As you can see, from Calvin's perspective, ministers were not to be lone rangers. Rather, ministry was to be a partnership. The company of pastors allowed thus for there to be collegiality and unity, mutual encouragement and accountability among the ministers who worked alongside Calvin. A second institution that Calvin establishes in Geneva was known as the Congregation. The Congregation was founded in Geneva in the early 1540s. It met every Friday morning at 7 a.m. before the company of pastors meetings. Now, the congregation, or at least the idea of the congregation, was not unique to Calvin. Calvin here was really taking a play from the book of Zwingli, who had established an institution known as Prophesying, or Prophetsai, in Zurich 15 years earlier. In Calvin's Geneva, the congregation was a kind of intensive public Bible study required for the city's pastors. At this meeting held on Friday mornings at 7 a.m. All of the city and countryside pastors, along with theological students and interested lay people, would gather for several hours of intense exegetical study of the Bible. This vision was built upon a passage in 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul writes that two or three prophets should speak and others should weigh carefully what is said, for the spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. And reformed pastors like Calvin and Zwingli believed that this was a mandate for pastors, as it were, to continue to learn together, to examine one another's sermons, to, as it were, exhort one another on to the interpretation and right application of Scripture. The congregation, as an institution, was for the first time framed in the Ecclesiastical Ordinances of 1561, which described its purpose. And let me read for you uh, that constitution that describes the purpose of Calvin's congregation. Here I quote, It will be expedient for all the ministers, in order to preserve purity and unity of doctrine among them, to meet together one day each week for a conference on Scripture, and no one will be exempt unless he has a legitimate excuse. So as to assure that everyone is diligent in study and no one becomes nonchalant, each minister will be given a turn explaining the scripture from week to week. Afterwards, the ministers will retire, and each member of the company will advise the person who explained the text what was wrong, so that this censure might serve to correct him. The format thus was on any given Friday morning, one or two pastors would be required to provide a kind of exegetical description and a miniature sermon of the text chosen for that week. The assembly would begin in prayer, and then the designated ministers 
would read the chosen biblical passage aloud and offered a detailed commentary and exposition of the text drawn from their knowledge of the Greek and the Hebrew. At the end of this presentation, the minister or ministers would invite his, or his colleagues to correct or add to his interpretation and application of the text. It was not uncommon for lengthy discussions to follow. Eric de Boer of the Free University of Amsterdam has recently shown that the congregation was a place where Calvin tried out his exegesis. In fact, we can see a similarity. We can see connections between the work of the congregation year in and year out and Calvin's commentaries. Calvin writes commentaries after texts and books of the Bible have been vetted and discussed within the congregation itself. There's an important principle here for Calvin. Calvin believes that ultimately the scripture should be interpreted in community. The place of biblical exegesis is not simply the pastor's desk, but rather the company of pastors, the, the ministers together, studying scripture, correcting one another, supplementing one another, iron sharpening iron as they study the word of God preparing to proclaim the word of God Sunday in and Sunday out. Calvin describes this in a very interesting letter to one of his pastoral colleagues in Bern. Calvin writes, The fewer discussions of doctrine we have together, the greater the danger of pernicious opinions. For solitude leads to great abuse. A solitary pastor is a danger to himself and to his congregation. Exegesis should be done in community. And at the same time, pastors need to continue to improve as students of the Word of God who deliver the Word of God to God's people. And so in this second institution, again, we see Calvin's concern with collegiality and accountability but also what we might call uh, continuing education for pastors. Pastors needed to continue to grow in their ability to understand God's word and proclaim it to God's people. A third institution, the quarterly censure. Now this institution was original with Calvin. Four times a year, the week before the quarterly communion service was celebrated, all of the city ministers would meet together behind closed doors for communal examination and fraternal correction. This was an opportunity for the ministers to air their grievances against one another, to offer fraternal correction on matters of doctrine and personal moral character. This was the place where the ministers dealt with their junk as a community of believers. We know very little about what happened within the quarterly censure because this was ultra private. The ministers met behind closed doors and generally what happened behind closed doors stayed behind closed doors. We do know that in these meetings that would last for several hours, the moderator of the company of pastors during Calvin's lifetime, Calvin himself, would begin the conference by confessing his own failures, errors, and inadequacies. And then the other ministers would do likewise, and again, if need be, fraternal corrections, personal confession would take place. The goal of the quarterly censure, thus, was the reconciliation of Geneva's ministers one to another, they were to be fellow workers in Christ's church. They were to work together. It was also a place where inaccurate doctrine could be corrected. At the end of this, what must have been a very emotional, uh, very uh, emotionally charged meeting, at the end of this quarterly censure, the ministers, as a visible sign of their unity, would conclude their meeting by sharing a meal of soup together. 
I mentioned that the quarterly censure was really clothed in secrecy, but we do get windows from time to time of some of the kinds of issues that the quarterly censure addressed. On one occasion, the ministers censured a colleague for being arrogant and for slandering a city official. On another occasion, the, co the quarterly censure uh, challenged two pastors who were at odds with one another due to a financial dispute, urging them to be reconciled to one another. On another occasion, a pastor was censured for beating up one of his parishioners who arrived late to his sermon. Yet another time, a pastor was censured for preaching an inflammatory sermon in which he attacked the city magistrates. On still other occasions, Geneva's pastors were censured for teaching wrong doctrine or for writing books that insinuated error in theology or biblical interpretation. One of the most notorious course cases that came before the quarterly censure, at least during Calvin's lifetime, was the case of Jean Ferron. And here we know a little more about Jean Ferron. Jean Ferron was one of Calvin's earliest pastoral co colleagues, who in the spring of 1549 uh, was accused by a servant girl within his household of having groped her while his wife was away on a trip. After questioning, Theron admitted to the charge. Yes, he in fact had groped this young woman, but he had done it in order to, as he put it, test to see if she's a good girl. Theron's case was brought before the quarterly censure in April of 1549, where the ministers, again, behind closed doors, voted to reprimand him and transfer him to a different parish. Theron was outraged by this decision. He stood up in the quarterly censure and delivered a blistering rejoinder, claiming that there was no brotherhood among the ministers and accusing Calvin of being heavy-handed and vindictive. At the end of his speech, he stormed out of the meeting. Two days later, Geneva's ministers met once again in secret session, and they dismissed Calvin and Ferron from the meeting in order to, com to consider the merits of the case in this emergency session. After lengthy deliberation, the quarterly censure exonerated Calvin and ordered that Ferron be suspended from the ministry. The quarterly censure, an institution that Calvin established in Geneva that promoted pastoral unity, that allowed for reconciliation, and again, provided accountability of ministers like Theron, who might have betrayed their pastoral charge. Well, finally, a fourth institution, that of the consistory. One of the most distinctive institutions established by Calvin in Geneva, uh, beginning in 1542, was his consistory. The consistory was a disciplinary body that included the city's pastors, along with 12 lay elders that met every Thursday at noon to address matters requiring church discipline in the city. During John Calvin's lifetime, hundreds of disciplinary cases were brought before the consistory each year. And many of these cases were very difficult, very painful, sometimes horrifying. Cases of adultery and fornication, petty theft, public drunkenness, spousal and child abuse, folk religion, business fraud, interpersonal conflict, illicit dancing and singing, blasphemy, gambling, gross religious ignorance, and the list goes on. From Calvin's perspective, the consistory, indeed church discipline, was intended by God to bring about repentance, to heal broken relationships, and to promote reconciliation between God's people. The purpose was not primarily punitive. Rather, church discipline was spiritual medicine, as Calvin writes. In the Institutes, he says this about church discipline. Here I quote, As the saving doctrine of Christ is the soul of the church, so does discipline serve as its sinews through which the members of the body hold together each in its own place. Thus, all who desire to remove discipline or to hinder 
its restoration, are surely contributing to the ultimate dissolution of the church. What I find interesting is that the consistory of Geneva, including pastors and elders, not only disciplined lay people, but on multiple occasions during Calvin's lifetime and others, the consistory also disciplined pastors who had committed gross moral failures. Between 1542 and 1609, I've documented 18 cases where ministers of Geneva were called before the consistory for moral failure and reprimanded or suspended from the Lord's Supper. Those cases included fornication and adultery, rebellion against the company of pastors and the city magistrates, dereliction of duty, avarice, outrageous behavior, spousal abuse, and dishonest business practices. Let me give you just one example. I could give many, but let me give one example. And that will be the case of the veteran minister, Simon Goulard. Simon Goulard was one of the chief pastors of Geneva by the end of the 16th century. Uh, a stalwart, had an international reputation as an author and as a reformed churchman, who in July 1595 announced to the company of pastors that he would never preach again. He was finished. He was done. And he was only 52 years of age. For weeks, Simon Goulard's anger had been smoldering over what he saw as a clear case of injustice on the part of Geneva's magistrates. He was outraged. And he recognized that if he stood up in the pulpit again, he would blast the magistrates and make things even worse. And so he refused to preach week after week after week. The company of pastors intervened. They found it completely contrary to reason that the pastor of the gospel would not preach. In their minds, this was inconceivable. Pastors preach. They ordered Goulart to return to the pulpit. Finally, after weeks of arm twisting and threats, Simon Goulart returned to the pulpit on a Sunday morning in August and delivered a most memorable sermon. From his pulpit that day, he violently attacked the magistrates. He lashed out at the lay people in his congregation. And then he did the very improvident thing of calling the mistress of the French king a whore. That was perhaps that last accusation that especially caught the attention of the Genevan magistrates who were always afraid of French intervention. Goulard was arrested, placed under house arrest, and it was at this juncture that the consistory intervened. Simon Goulard was brought to consistory, and over several weeks, after several interviews, Goulart was brought to a point of repentance. He made a public apology to the city magistrates and agreed, finally, to submit his will to the will of the pastoral company, to the will of his peers. Goulart was thereafter restored to the church, became a pastor again within the city, and indeed, for the next 25 years, was arguably the most important church leader in Geneva, and indeed within Reformed Protestantism. So once again, we see an institution that promotes accountability, an institution that demanded the highest standards of moral behavior of clergy, as well as lay people. The consistory didn't primarily or simply punish sin, but sought to achieve reconciliation of pastors, one to another and also to their churches at large. Four institutions, a company of pastors, the congregation, the quarterly censure, the consistory, they were one important factor in promoting the unity, the accountability, and we could argue the longevity of pastors in Calvin's Geneva. I find it interesting that in the very early years of Calvin's ministry in Geneva, before these institutions are established, Pastoral tenure within the city was about three years per man. Remarkable. 
By the, 15, for, by the 1550s, the average length of ministry of city pastors had risen to 14 years. By the end of the century, pastoral longevity of pastors within the city walls had reached 25 years and more. Now, there were many factors accounting for that. And clearly, Calvin's institutions were not the only uh, reason for pastoral longevity during these years. But I suspect it was an important one insofar as it promoted unity, accountability, spiritual encouragement, as well as reconciliation when that was needed. Well, finally, let's move on to section three, and this will be much briefer. Points of application for contemporary ministry. I think Calvin's example reminds us that the proclamation of the word of God must be central in the pastor's vocation. Just as in Calvin's day, so in our day, the word of God is essential for spiritual reformation and renewal in our churches. In some corners of evangelicalism today, I fear, evangelical pastors have lost their nerve in the power of God's word to transform lives. And so the Christian sermon becomes decorated with all sorts of extraneous things but the word of God is not preached in its integrity and power. Calvin reminds us that ultimately the word of God is at the heart of what Christian pastors are called to do. Christian pastors who proclaim the word in sermon, in sacrament, in liturgy and song. Christian pastors are ultimately called to proclaim, to proclaim the message of salvation in Christ, the gospel. And so Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture and to preaching and teaching. That was true in Geneva. It needs to be true in our churches as well. A second point of application. God frequently uses institutions to preserve Christian truth and promote pastoral well-being. Scholars debate why, why Calvin's theology and model of ministry has had such a long and significant place in the history of the Christian church. Humanly speaking, one of the chief reasons, I believe, is that he created institutions to preserve his biblical and theological vision. As we've seen, several of these institutions were intended to shape clerical culture in Geneva, creating pastors who are accountable to one another, maturing in their professional skills, addressing interpersonal conflict, and working together for the cause of Christ. As evangelicals, we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and open to how the Spirit might lead us to establish new institutions and organizations that can facilitate spiritual growth among ministers and foster their faithfulness in ministry. Again, I think of the words of James Smith, Institutions are ways to love our neighbors. Institutions are durable, concrete structures that, when functioning well, cultivate all of creation's potential toward what God's desire, what God desires. Shalom, peace, goodness, justice, flourishing, delight. A third point of application. A pastor's well-being requires healthy relationships with other Christian leaders. Studies conducted by the Lilly Foundation on pastoral longevity have found that one of the best indicators for pastoral success in terms of longevity was meaningful, sustained relationships with other pastors. Lone Ranger pastors don't last very long in the hard, scrabble world of parish ministry. The Apostle Paul understood this, didn't he? We can't read Paul's epistles without being impressed by all the people who worked alongside him. Or to put it slightly differently, all the people that Paul worked alongside. Colleagues in Christ who traveled with him, lived with him, evangelized with him, planted churches with him. When we look at Romans 16, for example, Paul mentions no fewer than 35 men and women who were co-workers, kinsmen, beloved in the Lord, 
workers in the Lord, brothers and sisters, fellow workers, to use Paul's language. Paul recognized how important, how necessary life-on-life -life relationships are for effective pastoral work. Lasting ministry requires relationships, relationships of accountability, relationships of encouragement, relationships of spiritual vitality. <clears throat> in Geneva, Calvin's company of pastors functioned in this way. And I think in our churches, in our contexts, pastors are and pastors need to continue to foster these kinds of pastoral relationships, institutions that allow for relationship, growth, unity, and encouragement. I'm reminded, for example, of a group of Presbyterian ministers in California. They call themselves the Company of Pastors, who meet once a month to discuss books, to pray for one another, to hold one another accountable. And I suspect that many of the pastors in this room are part of uh, various kinds of pastoral groups, uh, community groups, to encourage one another and help one another. This is essential for pastoral longevity. Calvin knew it. Uh, modern research proves it. A fourth application. A pastor's well-being requires accountability to other Christian leaders. For Calvin, ministers of the gospel need to be subject to their colleagues and ultimately to God. Pastors are not islands to themselves. Their parishes are not their personal fiefdoms. In an evangelical world that is too often beholden to kingdom building and ministry empires, the churches of our world today need to recover a recognition that pastors need accountability, whether it be to a church board, whether it be to a, in a multi-staff context to other pastors on staff, or perhaps other pastors within their denomination or within their community. Accountability is essential. And finally, a pastor's well-being requires continued spiritual and professional growth. The Apostle Paul writes to his young cohort, Timothy, do your best to present yourself to, yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. God's intention is not, that, is not that ministers leave seminary as finished products with nothing more to learn. As ministers, we need to foster a teachable spirit and place ourselves in relationships where people who care about us can offer advice and, and encouragement. We need to be in context where we continue, can continue to grow. Calvin understood this. His congregation was a place where pastors could learn where they could cut their teeth on the biblical text, where they could be corrected, where they could be ever-growing as exegetes and preachers and pastors of God's flock. When I graduated from TED's with my MDiv in 1986, Warren Wiersbe was the graduation speaker. I'll never forget the advice he gave to us young graduates. He warned the graduates of viewing seminary as a place where seminarians acquire a bag of tricks, a bag of tricks containing clever ministry ideas, a few good sermons, leadership strategies, a bag of tricks that they then open up and empty out during the first few years of ministry in a local congregation. A bag of tricks which, once it's empty, requires the pastor to move to a new church. Rather, Wearsby exhorted us to develop spiritual lives of accountability, spiritual lives characterized by continued growth in God's word, where we, like the psalmist, would be trees planted by streams of water that bore fruit in good season, meditating upon the word, growing in a knowledge of God's word, growing as effective preachers of God's word. Calvin was concerned about that too creating institutions to preserve a theological vision, a theological legacy built upon the word of God, institutionalized through clerical organizations that promoted accountability, health, and flourishing of pastors. And so we return to the words of Calvin, <clears throat> 
in conclusion, words reminding us of the centrality of the word, taken from book four of his institutes. Calvin writes, Here then is the sovereign power with which the pastors of the church ought to be endowed. That is, that they may dare boldly do all things by God's word, may compel all worldly power, glory, wisdom, and exaltation to yield to, to and obey his majesty. Supported by his power, may command all from the highest even to the last, may build up Christ's household and cast down Satan's, may feed the sheep and drive away the wolves, may instruct and exhort the teachable, may accuse, rebuke, and subdue the rebellious and stubborn, may bind and loose, finally, if need be, may launch thunderbolts and lightnings, but do all things in God's word. Thanks so much for your patience, for your attention. Thanks.